Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, wow, that's loud. Okay, so um, before I get started, uh, if you want to tweet about my talk, uh, add that CRDT hashtag uh, to your tweets. You'll, you'll see why in a little bit. Okay, can everybody still hear me when I turn this down a little bit? Okay. So uh, I'm talking about eventually consistent data structures. So first pre preliminaries, I work for Basho. We make React. React is this awesome uh, distributed NoSQL database. Um, and we hope you enjoy the drinks downstairs after. Um, we're very happy to sponsor Berlin Buzzwords again. Is everybody having a good time at Berlin Buzzwords? All right. Great, great. So a little bit about React. React is eventually consistent, and incidentally, so are Voldemort and Cassandra. So if you have experience with either of these three, um, you might uh, have a little bit of a background for what I'm going to talk about today. Eventually, cons eventual consistency is interesting, uh, because in an eventually consistent system, you tend to have multiple copies of the same datum, uh, which means it's replicated. Uh, so this gives you things like, like availability and, and fault tolerance and just... Um, you know, the, the uh, ability to have multiple copies of your data for, for the sake of, of safety. Um, they also tend to, <laughs> sorry, that was really bad. They also tend to allow loose coordination um, and things like sloppy quorums. So uh, since they don't require expensive uh, multi-phase commit protocols like Paxos and two-phase commit, um, this means that they are, uh, tend to be more available. Um, and resilient to network partitions. So eventually consistent systems, in order to be eventually consistent, must also include some means to move forward toward a final state. So uh, being replicated and being, having sloppy quorums or having uh, some sort of looser coordination of rights is not sufficient. There needs to be a way to move forward toward a final state where um, all of the replicas agree and give the right answer back to the client. Um, so, uh, when, especially when staleness is detected, uh, systems like Cassandra and React and Voldemort use a technique called read repair, which is when they read, uh, they, they read a, an item out of the database, then if any of the replicas in that ring of, of machines is out of date, then it will get that newest copy written back to it. So this is one way in which uh, eventually consistent systems like, like the three I've mentioned uh, move forward. Eventual consistency is good. Um, it's a practical choice. I, I don't think it's as simple to understand as an ACID system, like a relational database. Um, partly because uh, you're not given strong guarantees about what's going to happen, ever. But on the other hand, the practical benefits often outweigh that initial confusion. So when, you're, when an eventually consistent system encounters failures, especially network-related ones, um, it can more often remain available uh, to, uh, to your, your application uh, for reads and writes in spite of those failures, which is what makes it compelling. In the same vein, relying on uh, dynamic participation, loose coordination of rights uh, tends to lend itself to systems that have low and consistent latency. So uh, you're basically, in this sense, uh, choosing to relax the constraints of consistency so that you can have a highly available uh, low latency system. So what does this mean with, return, with respect to consistency? This is the classic cap theorem trade-off. You basically sacrifice total linearizability of all events, all write events. You sacrifice strict consistency. Since there's no total ordering, anything can happen at any time, uh, you have no transactions. And you basically ha also have weak guarantees of whether replication events are delivered to their target. Makes things a little challenging. It's incredibly difficult to decide in this, in this picture up here who wins when two writes happen concurrently. Uh, the solution to both of uh, these problems of concurrency and, and bad, bad uh, possibly inconsistent delivery are not ideal. Um, so, but they're generally first, what, you can throw one of them out by some kind of uh, fiat, uh, or you can choose to keep both 
of the values that might have been written concurrently. So in the three systems that I've mentioned already, Cassandra chooses the first one. It uses a timestamp-based resolution at the column level. Um, and Rioc and Voldemort decide to keep both values. So if there's ever a case where it detects a uh, concurrent write, um, it'll choose to, to hold on to both of those and hand them back to the client. So maybe you chose Rioc or Voldemort, um, and you get write conflicts. Rioc incidentally calls these siblings. Now that you've got both values, and they disagree very vehemently, as you can see, um, how does your application decide what the real state should be? Well, uh, up until recently, uh, the answer that we've been telling our customers and our open source users is that you need to use semantic resolution. And this, in some ways, is kind of a hand-wavy solution. But the idea is that your application knows the business logic. It knows the domain of the problem. And so it should know, use its existing business logic to decide, how do I resolve these conflicts? Given these two values for, this, for the same key, what do I do with them? Well, the, cl the classic example comes to Amazon's Dynamo paper, which is their shopping cart. The idea is that uh, it's going to always merge the, the conflicting values toward the maximum quantity of each item, each individual item in the cart. So if you had said, I, I want two copies of uh, this book and one of these CDs, and then in some other cart you have only one copy of the, CD, of the, the book, then you know, it's going to merge toward two copies of the book and one copy of the CD. Um, so one of the problems with this, this sort of ad hoc uh, resolution is something that they actually discussed in the, in the Dynamo paper, and they say, oh, this isn't a problem for our, for our business problem we're trying to solve. Um, is that sometimes when items were removed from the cart, they might reappear later. Um, and that's because some stale replica received uh, an event too late, and uh, the items still happen to be there in the cart. You know, it's, it's okay from their point of view because they think, oh, maybe they'll accidentally buy it and we'll get a bigger sale, right? Um, <laughs> But isn't that a, that's a bewildering user experience. I, you know, I would prefer not to give my users that experience. And it, it's a way that the, the, the database is leaking too much into the user interface. So um, recently, and I say recently, this is even before my first time at Berlin Buzzwords, but uh, we just became aware of it more recently. Uh, there's an, some interesting research that takes a more rigorous approach to this problem. And um, they even go into to, uh, proofs of various data types. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about those today. And actually, the people who worked on this research say that exact thing about this, this approach of semantic resolution. Ad hoc approaches are brittle and error prone. So it's probably better not to do them. So. Uh, this research I mentioned, it's uh, sometimes called conflict-free replicated data types. I chose the more suggestive title of eventually consistent data structures uh, in my, for my talk because I felt like that would bring it in. Uh, this, this sounds very academic. Um, but this, basic, this term basically means that uh, instead of strictly opaque values that you might have in a Cassandra column or a Rioc or Voldemort value, um, the data store provides more useful abstract data structures. Um, so these are things you can build things with rather than just a place to dump uh, whatever data you have. And since we're an eventually consistent replicated system, obviously the data structure is replicated to multiple locations in your, your database. And all of these locations, as they do in a Dynamo style system, can act independently of one another. This is really important for maintaining availability. But, of course, the most compelling part of these data structures is that they have the ability to resolve automatically toward a single value. So given any number of conflicting versions, they have a deterministic way to move forward in, in time. And they, they use a, a complicated term for this called a, a join semi-lattice, but it basically means that given any ordering of events, they all eventually converge to the same state. Okay, so this is uh, the primary work on this research is called a comprehensive study of convergent and commutative replicated data types. Uh, it's been done by two researchers at INRIA and uh, some colleagues of theirs in Portugal 
Um, the primary author on this, on this paper, Mark Shapiro, has also given a great talk at Microsoft Research, uh, which you can find online. I, I highly recommend you, you watch that. It's called uh, Strong Eventual Consistency. And this paper, um, I must admit, is where I got a lot of the content of this talk and some of the diagrams too. So um, basically all the pictures except uh, you know, Calvin and Susie a couple ones back are, are from this, this paper. Now, um, this is a huge paper and full of really uh, interesting but intricate uh, information. So what I wanted to do is boil it down to 40 minutes. If you want to read the whole thing, you can search for that on the internet. It's free to download. So I'm just going to cover the high points of the paper. There are two flavors of what we call CRDTs, conflict-free replicated data types. Uh, the first one is, is called convergent, and the second one is called commutative. They, provide bo they both provide that same f uh, property of being conflict-free um, when, uh, when needing to resolve, but they differ in how they're implemented inside the data store. So convergent types are based on a local modification of state, uh, which they f follow up by forwarding the resulting state downstream. Um, and downstream at the other replicas, uh, a merge operation is performed. So it takes the state that's incoming and merges it with its local state. And so these are the two operations, uh, local modification and merge. Um, the interesting thing about convergent data types is that they encode in the state itself uh, all of the information needed to converge to the final state. Um, and they're, uh, they're great for Dynamo style systems that have these weak messaging guarantees. Um, so they can also be resolved in clients, which is uh, an interesting thing that you could actually use a, a data store that doesn't have CRDTs built in and implement it on the client side. So commutative types, on the other hand, um, re rely on replicating commutative operations. So operations are sent over the wire rather than state. Um, it's like add this thing, uh, remove this thing, those like more like commands. Um, but the, the trade-off with commutative data types is that they rely on systems that have reliable broadcast. So um, if you have uh, some sort of reliable uh, messaging channel that ensures uh, re-delivery at most once delivery, then uh, commutative data types uh, would work well. The, the interesting thing, though, is that they don't, in a global sense, need a total ordering. Um, of those uh, operations that you're performing on, on the, the data type. They only need a local causal ordering. So this event came after this one locally at this given replica. Now, I've been saying a lot, I've been throwing out a lot of words. It's easier to show in pictures. So let's look at what convergent CRDTs look like in pictures. Uh, basically, uh, the top line, you see the blue one. We have three replicas of our data type. Um, and at the source, uh, on the blue one, we apply this function f which modifies the state. Uh, concurrently at X2, uh, the uh, local state there is modified by function G. And then each of those replicas forwards their new state to the other replicas, and those replicas merge. And so in the end, you actually get uh, the combination of the, the two application of those, those operations. So as long as all of the replicas in this setup eventually receive states, that include all of the previously happening mutations, they will converge on the same value. Okay. Uh, now, commutative CRDTs, again, they forward operations rather than state. So uh, obviously, if an operation is, is not delivered or applied out of order locally, then the states won't converge. However, again, like the, the convergent, unlike the convergent type, you have a reliable broadcast channel. So you have assurances that messages will eventually be delivered. So as long as these two functions, f and g, that we did previously in the state, but now are actually operations, as long as those two operations commute when they're happening concurrently, the state will converge. OK, so that's the basic overview of, of like how these things are structured. Um, there's a lot more uh, in the paper about uh, you know, proof of correctness, uh, liveness, and safety, and all, all those things that are required about distributed systems. But I'm going to tell you about what data types we have available uh, that are CRDTs. So the first one, if it will move forward, it's not. OK. The first one is registers. A register is the simplest type of data structure. It's basically a memory cell containing an opaque value. Uh, 
That sounds kind of familiar, right? Um, it only supports two operations, assign and value, which are basically set and get, respectively. Um, concurrent updates to registers will not commute. Um, we've seen this problem before. It's the same problem of concurrent writes in a Dynamo system. So the two approaches are last write wins, which they call last write win register. And these are basically like columns in Cassandra. Um, so last write wins includes a, an opaque timestamp that the system itself can resolve between any two versions of the same value. Uh, the other option is what's in Rioc and Voldemort. They use uh, multi-valued registers. So these objects, these values, um, are basically uh, tagged with some kind of version vector that lets you resolve uh, the ancestry of each individual value and then detect when uh, individual writes don't immediately follow the one that came before. So um, what they end up doing is produce the union of all divergent values back to the client. Um, now the interesting thing is that might sound like a set, right, with the set union operation, but it doesn't necessarily act like a set because you might have differing, uh, differing uh, paths to the same value that don't come after each other. Um, I sh should have put a diagram for that. So uh, the next data type is counters. Everybody loves counters. Um, you want to count things all the time. They're basically, in a CRDT, they're a replicated integer, and they support two operations, increment and decrement, pretty obvious. So they're useful for tracking things like numbers of logged in users or click-throughs on an advertisement. Um, and the, the nice thing about counters is that the simplest type is a commutative or operation-based data type. So add and subtract are commutative mathematical operations. So any delivery order is going to produce the same value in the end. Now, assuming that, that is you're not bound by like you know a 32 or 64-bit integer and it overflows or underflows or something. Um, so that's kind of trivial. But so let's look at the state-based counters, which I think are more interesting. And as opposed to pictures, I'm going to do it a little bit more like code this time. So um, a G counter um, is basically a grow only counter. So this is a counter that you can only increment, you can't decrement. Um, and it's basically a version vector, a vector clock. So uh, you start with an empty list. Um, and then when a replica increments its counter, um, it will add a pair of its replica identifier and its current count to the list. And then it will increment it next time it updates it. So let's say uh, replica A inc increments the counter twice and starts forwarding it on to the other replicas. Uh, meanwhile, rec replica B, you know, it still had the empty state to start. And it decides that it's going to increment. And uh, you'll see that in the A replica, we've reached a counter of two. And in the B replica, we've reached a counter of one. So when these come together, they should re reach three. So we start to receive the merge operations. Uh, replica A gets it first. Um, replica B receives the first uh, merge state of A. And then finally, the second merge state of A. And you can see that the sum of all the counts of the pairs is the, um, the, the actual value of the counter. So we finally converged in the end. OK, so increment is useful, but you also want to decrement at times. Um, so there's a type called a PN counter, and that means positive and negative. Um, so it's basically the same as a G counter, except there's two of them. There's one for increments and one for decrements. So the value of this counter is the difference between the values of the two G counters. And each of those is merged individually um, pairwise. So when you get two conflicting replicas, uh, the states coming in, the P counter is merged as if it were a G counter, and the N counter is merged as if it were a G counter. Um, so the resolution is really simple. Uh, there's a couple other counters that I'm not talking about um, that are more interesting and kind of uh, less, less formally specified. So you should take a look at that in the paper. OK, sets. Sets are some of the most interesting basic data structures and some of the hardest to make convergent or commutative in a replicated data system. 
So the thing that's great about sets is that other types of data structures can be built out of sets. So you can build uh, containers for other things, you can build maps, you can build graphs, you can build basically pretty much any nested data structure out of sets. And sets basically only have two operations, that is to add an element to the set and to remove an element from the set. Okay, so just like we saw a G counter, a grow only counter, there's a G set that only grows in size. That is, it doesn't allow you to remove elements. Now this isn't incredibly useful for a lot of practical applications, um, but we'll see that this can be used as a building block for other data types. So uh, we're gonna go with the AB replicas thing again. Uh, so with a G set, it's gonna start empty. Um, and then A adds the items A and B to the set and starts forwarding its state uh, for merge operations. And concurrently, B adds letter C to the set. And then they start merging. A receives the value of, of B's uh, set and does a set union on them to get the total value. And you see, finally, the, the AB version is forwarded to B. And we've converged on the same set. So um, you could see where maybe this is a, a good for a list of things that happened in all time. Um, but uh, generally, you want to use some of these other types of sets instead of a G set. I'm going fast. So the second type of set they talk about is a two-p set or a two-phase set, um, and this is made up similarly to the PN counter of is made up of two G counters. This is a set that's made up of two grow-only sets, two G sets. Um, and this means that it has a set for add to the set and a set for remove. Now the interesting thing about this is that once something has been removed, you can't add it again. So um, basically that remove set acts as what we call colloquially a tombstone set. Um, this, this item is dead, it's no longer part of the set. So um, in order to prevent spurious states, where you might have removed something, for instance, before it was added. Um, this uh, data type has a, a, a precondition on the local update that you can't remove something that's not already in the add, add set. Uh, and since removes commute with each other and adds commute with each other, um, then it, it, it basically converges. So let's take a look at what, the, what that looks like. Uh, so you start empty, you have the adds and the removes. Uh, which are each grow only sets. And then A adds A and B, starts forwarding state, and it removes A, they decide they don't want that anymore. So you can see out there on the right, you have, in the first step you've got A is a member of the set, A, B's are, are, a and B are the members of the effective set, and then finally when you've removed A, B is the effective member of the set. And then you get down here and B adds C in its local copy, um, you might be seeing some similarity between these examples. <laughs> um, so it has only C in its set, um, and then we start merging. We get uh, A receives the add of C from the, uh, from the B replica, and it has its own local state that it merges with set unions on each of those items. And then uh, finally B receives uh, the adds from A and the, finally the remove, and so they come out with the converged state, which is just B and C. Okay, everyone take a breather, stand up, stretch or something. Heavy math stuff. Um, an interesting case of the, special case of the two-phase set is called a U set. Um, I don't have a, a slide for this one, I apologize, but um, basically it amounts to the same uh, idea, but if the system can guarantee some kind of uniqueness in a global sense, re reasonably probabilistic uniqueness, um, then you can potentially remove the item from the set without having to keep a tombstone around. And that's really useful by, you, you add it and you add uh, like a, a timestamp, like a Lampert clock um, or suitably random number. Um, and then when you remove it, you remove it with that tag and the operations commute. Okay, um, so that, that actually kind of leads you toward uh, the next one. Uh, 
Um, and I think this one is fun because for those of you familiar with uh, Cassandra, you'll immediately see how you can map this onto Cassandra. And it's called a last right wins by the element set. So the idea is that you tag the add and remove states uh, with a timestamp. Um, and then the greatest timestamp when trying to converge or commute the operations wins out for each individual element. So you have uh, the, the, the add set has a timestamp and the remove set has a timestamp along with the, the item and whichever one's greater uh, wins out. Um, and this is nice because then you can actually remove things from there and add them back later. Um, and the reason why I say this is interesting for Cassandra is because you could implement this with Cassandra super columns. Um, you could have uh, you know, a, an individual column that, that had the timestamp of added uh, with the element and then in some other uh, super column have the remove set. Okay, um, so that's a basic diagram of how that works. You see at the top that uh, the first replica adds A with a timestamp one and then it, it gets propagated down to the second uh, replica which removes A with a timestamp two and that gets forwarded and you have add A with a timestamp three at the third replica. Um, and so uh, you, you in the end uh, will, will converge on having A in the set. Okay, uh, probably the most useful set type is called an OR set which means observed remove. Um, so similar to the, the last right wins, uh, you tag each element uniquely. So each element in the set that goes in has a unique uh, identifier on it. And you don't necessarily expose that to the client. They're probably just going to say, add this thing to the set, remove this thing from the set. Um, but when you go to remove something from the set, in the local state, which you'll see uh, probably on that top blue line, in the local state, it's going to remove all seen replicas. So if you have multiple ads with different timestamps or different you know, tags or whatever, unique tags, um, then it will remove all local copies that it has seen. Um, and this commutes because the, there's a local causal consistency there. So there's a local causal order that makes sense. And you could do, this is a diagram of the operation based uh, type of OR set. Um, the state-based version, you could use a, a U set that I mentioned before uh, to implement that. Okay, so um, this is where I admit that the paper, as I was studying it, uh, got a little bit more complicated. And so um, the data structures get more comp complex, uh, the interconnections between them um, become uh, more intricate. But uh, I briefly do want to touch on graphs, since they solve so many interesting problems. Um, they're incredibly useful, but in a distributed system where you don't have total consensus, uh, they have a bunch of potential anomalies. And I, I want to describe a few of them to you. So um, they do go and solve some very constricted cases of graph data types, um, including uh, a composite graph data type that is a uh, used for cooperative text editing, like you're know, editing Google Docs or something. Um, but that's way too co too complex to cover in this this talk. So uh, do read it; it's interesting. Anyway, so uh, the the problems with graphs. Um, you all know a graph is basically a pair of vertexes and uh, vertices and edges, and the edges are the cr uh, subset of the cross product of the vertices. Um, so uh, what happens when you try to add an edge at the same time at two different replicas? If the constraint on this graph is that it needs to be directed and acyclic, then you've broken that constraint. So um, especially directed acyclic graphs, things like linked lists, um, are incredibly difficult to make replicated without conflicts that diverge rather than converge. Um, so you can, as I said, re remove some of those anomalies by restricting the semantics. Uh, say, for example, um, if you made a distributed acyclic, acyclic graph um, add only, like you could never remove edges, um, then you might be able to, uh, to get a graph that converges. And here, here's one example showing how 
even um, in, a, in a growable array type of data structure, um, that when you do concurrent operations and remove, they just generally don't converge. So uh, the simplest form of graph that they had proved that is a CRDT is called a 2P, 2P graph. And that basically means that the vertex, uh, why I keep saying vertices, um, are a set, a 2P set, and the edges are a 2P set. And the, uh, you have to come up with a policy of what happens when a vertex is removed and the edges are left dangling. Um, and their solution is, well, just the, the, the default answer is to remove all of the edges that point to or come originate from that vertex. So uh, the two-phase two set paradigm generalizes pretty well to this graph um, idea. OK, so that was a lot of math. <laughs> a lot of distributed systems message sequencing diagrams. Um, but let's talk about what, what are these useful for. That's what you're here, right? That's why you're here. So there are a lot of interesting use cases for, uh, for CRDTs. And they tend to be the ones that are hard to solve in distributed systems. Uh, one that I know of, uh, for instance, is the, the social graph issue. Um, if you wanted to keep this as a list of who I follow and who follows me, um, you could do that with an observed remove set. Otherwise, you could probably just use the, the, one of those graph implementations. Um, but you would, run it, of course, run into challenges of uh, what happens when, if you're representing it as a graph, what happens when you remove a vertex and not the edges. Uh, Obviously, the counters are great for things like analytics, web page visits, ad click-throughs, um, any, anything that requires you to count, like maybe logged in, number of logged in users. Um, the G counter would work really well for web page visits. You know, open one up at the beginning of the day, start incrementing it, um, or whatever time period you, you wanted to constrain it to. So uh, the other thing about the, this paper is they actually solve the anomalies in the Dynamo's shopping cart. And they use a modification of the OR set that lets you map a, an item to a quantity. Um, and so in this way, they will never see uh, replicas that, uh, I'm sorry, items that have been removed since they're uniquely tagged. They'll never see them pop up again when merged because they will have been uh, removed. Um, and actually, Ian told me earlier today a, a great uh, use case for a U set, um, which is the one that has unique um, adds and removes um, is the like button. So if you're doing something uh, like I like this post or I want to I want to share this on my own page, the like button is a good use case for the the use set. Okay, so I've talked a lot about why they're great um, and the details of how they're implemented, but they do have some challenges. Uh, the first and most obvious challenge is garbage collection. Uh, CRDTs tend to create a lot of garbage. Tombstones grow in the internal data structures. The data structures get imbalanced um, and need to be rebalanced. But those types of operations are difficult to do when you don't have synchronicity. So um, what they suggest, and I think this is, this is a, uh, a nice idea, is that you, in a, a separate uh, process that runs periodically, clean up the garbage with a, a, you know, a strong commit protocol like two-phase commit or Paxos or something. Um, luckily, although they get more inefficient over time, um, it doesn't impact correctness. So um, the garbage collection would only to be, be to improve performance or efficiency of transferring state. The second challenge is responsibility. Who's going to handle it? Um, right now, there's a number of client libraries I know of that implement some types of CRDTs. Um, and uh, I use the, up here, the uh, GitHub way of talking about these since they're all on GitHub. Uh, Mochi Media has created one for Erlang called StateBox. And it actually kind of implements both an operations and a state-based CRDT in the same, uh, same container. And they use that to resolve concurrent rights to people's, you guessed it, friends and followers lists. Um, so uh, that's, that's actually one that's in production. Um, there's a couple of other experimental libraries. There's one enclosure called Knockbox, um, which is very similar to Statebox, as I understand it. And then there's one that's in Ruby uh, that also tries to define some interchange formats for CRDTs uh, as, as uh, JSON objects. Um, and that's called Mean Girls. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> don't ask me. <laughs> um, so uh, the server side, there's really very few options. Um, I would say, uh, you know, Cassandra's counters are interesting, but they're not, not quite CRDTs. Um, we're thinking about doing them for React, uh, but I think we really need to get this on the server side if we want uh, people to, to actually use them and, and have a good experience. And that's all I have. Thank you. I'd be like, happy to take questions. Okay, thanks to Tron Grips. And are there any questions? Are you like I was? Mind blown! Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, being a little bit of a devil's advocate, after seeing all this complexity, wouldn't it be even better to do a traditional two-phase commit protocol instead? <laughs> yes. So maybe, maybe I didn't reinforce this enough at the beginning. It is a trade-off. So you either choose a, some kind of two-phase commit protocol that will potentially you know, be, be um, subject to Byzantine failures and even just incredible latency problems uh, and the, the, the protocol not moving forward because there's too much latency. Um, or you choose something eventually consistent where you don't have agreement around the, among the replicas and you have to resolve it later. Um, so this is, this is a fundamental trade-off and the idea is that, you know, the, the basic opaque eventual consistency is not good enough. Uh, for most applications, and we need a way to uh, to bring that to closer to what people expect out of strongly consistent systems. Um, I hope that addressed your question. I actually think that two-phase commit and Paxos are awesome, um, but for those types of applications that need eventual consistency, this is what you get. Any more questions? Uh, just to be clear, the identifiers that you tag, um, the primitives in the data structures, mm -hmm. are they per writer? So per serialized writer that you? Uh, it, it depends on, so tend, they tend to be local. Um, but uh, if you're using something like Lampert clocks, uh, which have some identifier of the writer built into the timestamp, um, then you always have a single way to resolve that, uh, to con converge forward. If, if that that makes sense. It, it does. It's, it's not. Um, it wasn't always obvious in my slides which type you use. I'm sorry. Okay. Because um, did the paper or have you, in your experience, uh, found a way of uh, avoiding explosion of identifiers? Yes. This is another problem. Um, if you are implementing the uh, the state convergence on the client side, mm -hmm. then you do have a problem with allocation of of. Uh, actor identifiers. Um, if you're doing it inside a system, then you basically, there's, there's going to be a limited number of replicas. So you choose the, the actor identifier for that individual replica. Okay. And are there any plans to expose uh, the replica identifiers from React? Um, no. <laughs> We'd rather you not worry about that. Um, but there, there are going to be ways to, there are, are already ways, but we're going to be improving the ways that you can constrict um, which actors you actually talk to in your quorum. But uh, this would be a separate, a separate thing. Any more questions? Okay. So as I heard, this was the last talk today. We can now get, um, take a drink at the ground floor and at 8.20 there will be the bus shuttles. And you, the only thing you have to do is to follow people who have t-shirts who are standing on Follow Me. Okay, thanks again to Sean.